Good afternoon. Welcome to the QA. We are live. It is the March 2023 edition of the QA for Guns and Tactics. Do appreciate you guys that are tuning in live, spending a little bit of time with me. And if you're catching this after the fact, you can, of course, catch it on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts. This is the show where we answer your questions. You can email us at the email address shown on the screen, or it is the QA at gunsandtactics.com. You email me your questions. They appear on the show. Or obviously, if you tune in live, they can appear live with your comments and all that cool stuff. We are now being able to uh, dual cast, I guess you could say, to both Facebook and YouTube, which is kind of cool. And uh, again, my name is Dave. I do appreciate you guys tuning in. Uh, we don't have a ton of questions this month uh, via email, so hopefully the comments will be good. But I also wanted to thank you guys because we're doing this on the last Friday of the month because this week has just been absolutely hectic. Uh, I'm doing a lot for my quote unquote day job. And for those of you guys that follow, you guys know that I've been doing this full time. But with that, there is other stuff that I do behind the scenes in the firearms industry. And some of that stuff has become incredibly busy. Uh, it's, it's really good, but it's still really busy. And when all of a sudden Friday or excuse me, Monday, which is when we normally were doing these, I started to have to schedule like staff meetings and other stuff on Mondays. And it, it just got to be like super hectic to where all of a sudden I got a text like, hey, it was Monday. How come no QA? And it's like, oh, my gosh, I totally forgot it was the last week of the month already. And then obviously Mondays are just really hectic because the week is just starting and we're trying to catch up. We have staff meetings, like I said. So anyways, it uh, it was crazy. It was absolutely crazy. So uh, we'll, we'll start answering your questions and stuff. But what I want to hear from you guys is Mondays are just too hectic for me. So if we were to continue with the live streams, which I will be up front, I actually really like. Uh, number one, I like being able to interact with you guys live. It's fun for me. I kind of feel like we get to host a show and uh, I just, I really enjoy it. So if there's a certain time or, you know, whatever that works better for you guys, uh, let me know. Uh, I'm leaning towards Fridays maybe, or maybe Wednesdays or something kind of middle of the week, midday. Uh, I'm in central time. So I don't know. I was thinking like maybe like Wednesday, have lunch with Dave live QA last Wednesday of the month. Maybe Fridays would work better, but, uh, there are times in the summer where Fridays I might want to like, you know, do some family stuff or whatever it might be. So it just kind of depends on what we have going on, but let me know what you think. Leave some comments, go from there and, uh, we'll do that. So, uh, one thing I do want to say right off the bat before we get into it is a huge thank you to our patrons uh, at the Action Jackson level. We have Kevin, who is our number one longest term, long time supporter. And then we also have the 10 Spot Club, which are featured here. And again, I can't thank you guys enough. As our patron community grows, we'll probably have an exclusive live QA for just patron supporters where we can kind of interact. I can let my hair down a little bit more and we can kind of just connect at a little, uh, little bit more and kind of talk some stuff. Uh, but there is a patron only group. We do have all the discount codes in there. So as that grows, we're going to continue to do more. So again, if you want to support the channel, please consider supporting us on Patreon. So I appreciate that. All right. We've got some comments here. Everyone's checking in. I super appreciate it. Uh, we got hit boy. Hello. We got Frank. Thank you very much for checking in Frank, Tim. And, uh, we got Dustin. Yes. So let's talk about this. Uh, I got to say, one of the things that I am most excited about right now is Yeti introduced their new limited edition color, which is just, I, I can't say, I don't want to swear because I think YouTube is working on algorithms to make swearing not as good, but check that out. Hopefully it blocks my face. There we go. It focuses. And this is a factory color. This They're calling it like canopy green, which those of you guys that know me, this is my jam. So I bought this and I also bought a water bottle um, and I'm probably going to buy another one as well. I'm not sponsored by Yeti. Uh, I do have an affiliate link. So that means if you use the link, we do get a, a really small commission. So I'll put a link to Yeti in the description below. And believe it or not, uh, I do really like their stuff. At first, I was kind of like, oh, they're overpriced or whatever. But some of their stuff is really nice, really well featured. Like this, what I like about this coffee cup is that it's leak proof which is great. So like when you're side by side riding or in the truck or whatever, and then when you want to open it, you just flip this little lid. And then there are other ones that has a little magnet. Uh, so they're really cool. I do like their stuff. And then I actually picked up their luggage and I've been traveling a ton with that last year. And I'm actually going to do a review on luggage, which I never thought I would do a luggage review, but 
There's a lot of you guys that travel, and I think it is good quality luggage. So I bought the Yeti luggage myself. Again, hashtag not sponsored. But Yeti, if you're watching, I'd be open to talking. You know what I mean? So anyways, let's uh, get to answering some questions. This first one is from Hitboy. What happened if I defend myself in a gun-free zone? Well, part of that uh, will depend on the state. Uh, every state is a little different. In some states, carrying a gun in a gun-free zone is a minimal crime, either a petty misdemeanor, like a citation only, or it's a misdemeanor. Some states, it could be a higher level. I'm not an expert or a lawyer in all of the states, but in my state, for example, yes, you could be charged with a misdemeanor for carrying in a posted gun-free zone. However, if it's a school or something like that, it is a higher crime. Uh, and I believe in Minnesota, it is a felony to carry in a school. So you have to be careful of that. Now, I've had many people say that's a risk they are willing to take, that they want to be there to be the good guy to defend that. Because maybe uh, we should talk about some of that. Because obviously with recent events, more and more people are interested in, you know, active shooter. And I thought about even doing a reaction video to the body cam of the uh, officer involved body cam from Nashville. But I, I don't know that I know there's other channels that do that. Like, obviously, the big one is donut operator, right? But I, I don't know if that's going to necessarily be my niche. Um, I, I don't know if I want to get into that or not, because I do have some perspective. I've been a I was a cop for 20 years, did a lot of active shooter training. I was a train the trainer for various active shooter programs. Uh, so it, it is kind of a, a subject that I have some some buy in with and I believe in. But I don't know, we can maybe talk about it, see what you guys think. We'll see where the conversation goes. But uh, I got to say, those two dudes, they did good work. And I'm not saying um, other people didn't do or whatever, but I'll just call it out there. Like if we compare them to the Uvalde response, like night and day. Uh, now, uh, we've already been joking in some of our circles of, okay, now are we going to see a push for LPVOs and blah, blah, blah. And for those of you guys that don't know, an LPVO, uh, LPB, LPVO, low power variable optic is one of the officers had that on his rifle, but it's looked like he didn't use it. It looked like the rifle was canted and he was using his backup red dot site or his offset red dot site. But anyways, um, we will, uh, we'll talk about that a little bit later. So anyways, though, to answer your question, it really does depend on your state laws. You could be charged with an offense for carrying in that. However, if you saved a bunch of lives, you stopped an active shooter, you did something or whatever, there is what's called prosecutorial discretion or prosecutorial discretion where they could choose not to charge you, which certainly could happen, which I, I don't know. I think the public outcry would maybe be that, or it just might be a potential consequence as well. So that is uh, that's a good question. Uh, this one's from Rodney. Hey, Dave, went with the Staccato C2. Awesome. You are going to love it. You are going to love it. That is a great all-around handgun. The Staccato C2 is like the Ford F-150 of handguns in a way, like a Glock 19 is also a Ford F-150, if you will, where it pretty much does everything really, really well. And you can carry it, you can train with it, you can conceal it, it handles well, it's pretty flat. Uh, it's just a great, great all-around handgun. I think you're going to love it. Did you get the optics model? And if so, what are you thinking for a dot? Because what I would maybe look at is an EPS, and I just got an EPS in, I'm going to put an EPS... I'll probably put an EPS on my C2 and then I'll probably put like the EPS carry on my CS is what I'm thinking. But anyways, I, yeah, I can do some other videos. I can't show firearms on live stuff, so we can't, I can't show you that kind of thing, but yeah, you're going to love the C2, man. It's a, it's an awesome, awesome pistol. Uh, I just picked up the CS as well. The nice little gun, uh, obviously a little bit more for the concealed carry crowd. All right. This one is this one's for our Frank. Oh, okay. So you're kind of your game with the schedule. I appreciate it. So my goal is to get it out there. So it's a published event. It's scheduled on YouTube, may, like maybe even a month ahead of time on Facebook, that kind of stuff. And then we can kind of tune in. So, but I appreciate it, man. Uh, I really do. I'm, I'm leaning towards like middle of the week, but we'll just kind of see what things look like. Uh, this one is like deployed. I'm not sure. Yeah. Oh my gosh. The stealth arms platypus. Get this. Here's what I need you to do for me. Will you do me a favor? Will you email them or call them and say, I would really like Dave Tim from Guns and Tactics to review this handgun. I really want to see what it's about. And if you want to put in there nice pleasantries like Dave is, you know, the most handsome YouTuber and he does a really good job. Oh, I'm just kidding. But I've actually been communicating with the owner of Stealth Arms 
and I requested a, a sample. Uh, they don't work a ton with some of the influencers and creators and all that other stuff. So I kind of explained to him what I'd be looking for is just a and e I don't need a free gun. I just want to try it. I want to see if the hype is there. I want to see how it works. I want to see how they design their trigger bow around Glock mags. And for those of you guys that don't know, the Stealth Arms Platypus is a 2011 style gun, uh, 1911 style gun, but it takes Glock magazines and they have a custom builder that you can you know, configure on their website. You can like pick your color, you can pick this, you can pick the optics cut, you can you know, do all this different stuff. And I really wanna check one out. Unfortunately, I don't have the budget right now to just buy one. So generally speaking, just so you guys are, you know, not that we're getting too off topic, but a lot of times when I get stuff for review, it's a T and E basis where a company will send it to me They'll send an invoice that's due in 90 days, 120 days, 180 days, whatever it might be. And at the end of that, I have to either give the gun back or I have to pay for it. And sometimes if I have the budget and I like the gun, I will buy it. And I usually tell you guys that. Uh, but what I also like is that I can am free to do my review. And generally, there's things I like about a lot of stuff. And if there's something I don't, I tell you. And, you know, it gives me the freedom and I don't have to have a huge financial interest. I'm still a small channel. If I had a ton of Patreon supporters or a ton of other income or whatever, where I could just buy this stuff, snatch it up and do it. I totally would. Uh, but I just I'm not quite there yet. I'd, I'd like to be, but I'm just not there yet. So uh, reach out to them. Tell them you want me to check out that gun because I really do want to check one out. So that uh, I think it is cool, though, if it runs. I think that's going to be a cool platform. A lot of people like 1911 single action triggers, the safety, if they if that slide and everything is really done nicely and it takes Glock mags. Because I will still argue one of the weakest links of the 2011 was the magazines and Staccato. And now Checkmate is coming out with some new mags for the 2011. Uh, they've really improved the reliability of the magazine. And, and in a way, I will still argue that the magazine is one of the most important parts of any firearm. And I know a lot of people overlook that. They think of it as a perishable item, a disposable item. And yes, I get all that. But if the thing doesn't function, let's think about that, right? I mean, the magazine is probably one of the most vital pieces of that of that firearm. So, uh, but yeah, I would love to see it because everybody knows that Glock mags are reliable. The grip angle is a little different. So I'm anxious to put one in my hand. If I would have known about them at shot, I would have definitely made my way there because the other gun, uh, that I was particularly excited to check out at shot was the Oracle arms 2311, which is a 1911, 2011 style gun that takes SIG 320 mags, which again, SIG 320 mags are pretty reliable. They have the military contract, blah, blah, blah. The gun felt good in my hand. Um, some people said they had some issues with it. I wasn't able to go to shot range day. I was at SIG range day, so I didn't get to any hands-on time. And I was supposed to have my sample, they were hoping March. And I get it. I don't hold people to that because production delays happen. Tweaks need to be you know, made, R&D adjustments, all that stuff. But I will say, um, if with any new gun startup company or whatever, there's always going to be challenges. There's always going to be teething issues, that kind of stuff. So it'll be curious to see you know, kind of how Oracle develops because they're, they're a totally new platform, but stealth at least does have uh, a little bit of background with some other products. So I would love to check that out though. But uh, all right, we got hit boy here from Houston. Um, yeah, I would check to see what Texas law is uh, check with your attorney general or your state legislative page, whatever state uh, law res, res, reservoir, whatever um, is in your state and just, you know, check with a, um, you can even go to handgunlaw.us, I believe is the website. They have an interactive map. You can see what the different handgun laws are in the different states. And that's also a really great resource for when you're traveling. So uh, there's one part of their website where if I select, I have my Minnesota permit to carry because that's where I am. And then it'll show me which states have reciprocity or which states I can travel to, which states I can't. If I wanted to go to this state, what permit I would potentially need. Now, I, I do have a little bit of a, a plus because I also have uh, HR 218 credentials, but Anyways, you know, yeah, that's a, that's a good question. So uh, this one is from Tim with uh, Washington House Bill 1240. Would suppressors be a part of that list? That's a great question. And actually, initially, the information that I received was that, yes, they were. However, when I finally got to do a final reading and we looked through it, uh, because I do work a lot with Rainier, obviously they're out of Washington and they're dealing with this House Bill 1240. For those of you guys that don't know, House Bill 1240 is an assault weapons ban in Washington that has already passed their house and is progressing in their Senate and their governor is chomping at the bit, like drooling at the mouth to sign this. Uh, what the information I'm seeing is that he is very eager 
wants to sign it, going to have a big celebratory party, and it's going to basically ban the sell or transfer of assault weapons or even parts that can be used to make assault weapons. And that's the big part, like bolt carrier groups, triggers, receivers, handguards, potentially even threaded barrels. All that stuff is going to likely be banned for sale or transfer in Washington or even going to Washington. So if you have it now, that's why a lot of these dealers are just get crazy. However, uh, silencers themselves appear to still be allowed. So moving forward, silencers should be allowed under HB 1240. However, part of that, I think, confusion was that there was a part of there of uh, a threaded barrel that can attach a silencer, and there was maybe a comma that people were reading. But the way I'm reading it is silencers should be good to go in Washington. So that's great. You guys can at least own those because there's a lot of people who still have a lot of silencers in jail and stuff like that. So great question, Tim. Great question. All right. This one is, uh, this is from Rodney. Uh, you had the C2 question. Yes, but I wanted to see if you recommended one. Uh, for the C2, uh, I would throw an EPS on there. And I think that EPS is going to be the ticket for a closed emitter slick system. The glass is really good. The distortion's really good. I would really really, really try to wait for an EPS. I like the multi-reticle system or the 3MOA, but uh, I don't know if I have one. Anyways, that's what I would go with for a C2. So I really like that. Or a 509 would be a great option as well. So uh, my C2 is currently at my friends at Danger Close Armament out of Colorado. Uh, David is an amazing stippling artist, and uh, I wish I could show you a picture. I'll, I'll show, it'll be, if you subscribe, I'll have a short video on it when I get it next week, but I sent him my C2, and he did his stippling, they uh, coated the barrel, they did Cerakote the frame, like the thing looks absolutely sweet, I cannot wait to get it in person, so uh, I'm really looking forward to getting my C2 back, but uh, it's going to be nice. Uh, so, being that we have a break in the comments, what do you guys think of the new background? So I rearranged the shop, and if I could show you, I would. Uh, and I, for the 100K, now that we hit our 100K, I am going to do a shop tour video when we launch our 100K giveaway. I'm still working on some prizes and things like that, and I don't have the plaque. I'm waiting for YouTube to give me my ding plaque, which if you're watching YouTube, I really want that. That for I know it's, it's petty, and it's just a thing, but for me, it's a big milestone, and it means a lot to me because... Uh, I gave up some stuff, you know, to to pick this path. And and for me, that is just kind of a, that's a trophy in a way. And I, I don't know, I'd be proud of it. But anyways, the studio. Obviously, it's the same bench. Uh, when I do the tour, I think, like, I'm actually really proud of how the bench turned out. I built this bench myself. And then I also built an apparatus on the bench that mounts the cameras that I use for production, the slider and the two cameras, which I normally use. Right now, I just have the one A cam. But... Uh, so everything mounts to that, and then I can, this is on wheels or casters, so I can move it around as I need to. Now, it used to be over there, and then over here is my mill and my little lathe. Uh, I, don't, I don't do a ton of machining, so I basically just have benchtop tools. For what I do, works fine. I can do slide serrations. I can do little parts. I can make little knobs. I don't do barrel threading. I farm that out. So for me, my bench top tools work really good. And then obviously over there was the patch wall and another bench with a computer and stuff like that. So, and I really loved that background because um, I, I just liked the look of it, right? But where I am here, um, and I, for the longest time, I didn't want people to know that I was making these videos in my garage. I wanted it to look like its own little shop or whatever, but this is a portion of my garage, just the way it is. So I'm coming clean. Now, that being said, We've had this, one of the snowiest winters. Uh, for snow removal, I use my lawnmower, which is like a John Deere X series, and I have a snow plow and a blower attachment and stuff like that. And that used to park literally right here. So I'd have to like pull out a car and then drive it out because the shop was, you know, by the door, the overhead door. Uh, but I was like, this is so frustrating. I have to do all of this just to, you know, do snow removal and stuff. So I rearranged and I moved the uh, the studio if you will, towards the back of the stall, and then that way towards the front of the stall by the door, I uh, can park my side-by-side, -side, which you guys have seen, as well as the tractor. So that way all I have to do is literally open the door and pull out. I thought I heard a truck, but it's actually just the wind. Uh, it's just kind of a crappy day, and again, in Minnesota here. But uh, so... I don't know. What do you guys think? I kind of like the shop-ish background. I don't think it looks too bad with some of the machinery. I might play with like some colored lights back there uh, because as I'm starting to, you know, remodel the studio a little bit, uh, my old fluorescent lights are starting to show their age. So I might look at, 
a LED studio light with an LED umbrella light to illuminate the bench because I really do love well-lit, detailed stuff. That's kind of been a signature of mine. Um, but And then maybe I might put a little bit of like accent lights, you know, behind here so that way I have a little bit of color to have like a little bit of a background and I might put um you know something up on the wall over there because the patch wall was on the wall over there and it actually moved up you can kind of see the corner of it right there I put it above the mill uh and that was heavy I couldn't believe how how big a how heavy a stupid patch wall is so uh but yeah let me know in the comments what you guys think of the backstop I would love to uh love to have your feedback. So uh, audio is still looking good. We still got some viewers. I think we're caught up on comments. Oh, we just had one come through and then we'll do some email questions. I had to send my XL to Staccato, the rear sight. Oh, really? That sucks. I'd be curious to see what it was, if the sight was out of spec, the dovetail, or if it just kind of came loose. But uh, the XL, true story, is the one Staccato I don't have. I have a couple of P's, a C2, a CS, an XC, and I really do want an XL because I do think that is one of their smoothest shooting handguns. But uh, I'm no longer with Staccato. So uh, I've made comments about this in the past that I was on their blue team, which is kind of like a law enforcement training group of brand ambassadors, if you will. And I would disclose that. Like when I would do videos about other 2011s or other 1911s, I would tell people like, look, I have a relationship with Staccato. Or when I did Staccato uh, videos, I would disclose that because I didn't want you guys to think, oh, it's just a shill and whatever. I'm not a shill. I didn't make any money if he stole, if I sold 100 Staccatos, Staccato didn't pay me a commission or anything. But Staccato did support me. And some people would be like, bro, they gave you a gun. You're, you're a paid mouthpiece or whatever. And it's like, there's a lot of companies that send me stuff, dudes. I'm not a paid mouthpiece. I can't pay my mortgage or my truck payment or put food on the table. Well, maybe I could with a, you, you could, but not lawfully, right? But I, for me, a tool that I use, i.e. a firearm, uh, it doesn't, that doesn't pay me. Like if you put me on monthly stipend or salaries or whatever, yes, then I'm an employee or a ambassador sponsor or whatever you want to call it where I'm getting paid. Then I would disclose that as well. But I actually didn't renew my relationship with Staccato, my blue team, because number one, uh, I really do want a little bit more freedom and I don't want people to even perceive the fact that I would be brand bias or that I would have a, an untruthful review or because a lot of people accused me of that with the Prodigy videos. They were like, of course you are happy the Prodigy didn't run well. You're a, you're a show for Staccato and you sponsored Staccato Shooter doesn't like Springfield. Imagine that and that kind of stuff. So for me to, you know, explore other things. So, but that's, that's that. So if you guys have any feedback or want to talk more about it, um, let me know. But did we uh, lose? Check, check. Did we uh, lose? All right. I'm not sure what happened, but my... Uh, I don't know what, what's going on here. Hmm. I don't know. Can you guys still hear me okay? Because now I just got a thing saying um, I'm in preview mode. All right. Are we back? I have no idea what happened. I have no idea. I must have hit a button or something. I don't know where. I was ranting about, you know, my relationship and staccato and, and all that. So I apologize. Uh, I apologize what happened. I'm not sure what, what, what the deal was, so... Uh, I don't know where I was, so I'll just have to edit this later. So the joys, the joys of live sometimes, right? The joys of live. So hopefully I didn't lose you guys, but uh, yeah. So let me uh, answer some email questions here quick, and then uh, we can kind of get to it. This first one is from Kevin, and Kevin, you you sent a bunch of questions in, and I I appreciate that. Um, I, I don't have time to put them all on the screen, but let's just kind of get through a few of them here. Uh, what do you recommend as a procedure to select the height over bore for a first point blank distance on something like an AR for an individual police officer that does not have a pool gun so they can do what they want? And then are there any AR schools or classes that use ballistic data and calculators along with ergonomic fitting to determine the correct height over bore? And then for women or children who have smaller heads, do you recommend the 2.6 height over bore um, going from there? So a lot to kind of take in. Let me make sure we kind of get through these. So uh, first, uh, first things first, uh, do I have a recommended procedure to select the height over bore for first point blank distance? And basically what he, what he's saying is that for point blank distance, if our target was say an eight inch plate, okay, what would the point blank distance be where I can hold 
and my correction is within that eight inches out to basically what distance is sometimes what we refer to. So we have a no correct out to so many, you know, so many yards or whatever. So if I held center of that eight inch plate and my standard was I had to get in an eight inch target, an eight inch plate. And if I held center, obviously there's going to be some rise and fall of that round. How far for point blank do I not have to worry about correction and stuff like that? So part of that obviously is going to depend on barrel length, ammunition, sight over bore, all sorts of things that go into it. Now, your other question was, are there any classes? And ironically, uh, Dustin, I think, I know you're here, but were you, you were in the marksman class. Uh, I do that in my marksman class. It's I called it patrol rifle marksman. It's a multi-day class. But one of the first things we do after we zero is I have chronographs and we actually start to get real data. And then we teach people how to use a basic app. Now, the criticism that I got from that class when I taught it, and it's been a couple of years since I've uh, taught that class was that I would spend a little bit too much time in the app and I, cause I like to nerd out about that stuff and I needed to kind of compress that to just get people the basics so that they know what their performance is. Fair enough. I took that to heart. So now I abbreviate that a little bit, but yes, in my class, we would chronograph. So you would get real data because in my opinion, that's the easiest, quickest way is to get the actual data is the chronograph. And now I even have a lab radar so we can get better data. Uh, and then we would type that into the app and we would figure out what that is for that person. Now, I will also counter with this in that a class is not the place to change optic mounts. That's just logistically not possible. People are gonna show up with what they have and you can talk about the benefits. So like generally when I bring a couple of demos, I'll have different stuff so people can talk about or you know try it. But class, they're not gonna take off their optic, put on a different mount and adjust it and have these light bulb moments. Unfortunately, it's just not the place because we'd have to wait for thread locker to dry. We'd have to have different mounts on hand. And it's just, maybe if you had a large retail space and extra time to have like a dry fitting day, classroom portion, and then overnight, I, I don't know, that would be like the dream, right? If I had a facility to do all that. But realistically for most travel classes and stuff, it's just not, not gonna happen. So, uh, but uh, yeah, Dustin was there, yeah. So. I do that and then we kind of talk about that. Now, as far as what would be optimal for a person is it's gonna depend a little bit. Now, the higher the height over bore of, of the mount, the more upright we can be, which a lot of people really like it. Now, the downside is when you're shooting prone, you have to kind of you know, stretch your neck a little bit more. So some people don't like that. But the reality is how many times are we really shooting prone? How many officer involved shootings do we see with patrol rifle people shooting prone? Not very many. How many three gun matches or competition matches or whatever, are you shooting prone? There's some, right? So you have to figure out like what's reasonable, what's probable, what's possible, and kind of figure out the best of everything. For me, just me, I, my opinion, with LPVOs, I still prefer a standard height or maybe like a 1.7 height mount. However, for night vision, yeah, I do have a couple of uh, guns with a 193 or a higher riser because then if I'm going to be using that with night vision, it kind of lines up and it's easier for me to get behind that to use passive aiming. So part of that is going to depend on what is set up for you. And then obviously what ammunition, the barrel length for velocity, all that stuff is going to kind of go into it. So as far as other classes, uh, that's the one thing I'm not trying to say like my claim to fame, but I'm not aware of any other class where they bring a chronograph and they give you data like Sometimes they do truing. I've been to classes where we'll shoot out to two, 300 yards and then we'll measure and make an adjustment in the app or we'll spend like a whole day zeroing, it seemed like. Uh, Dustin, I think you were there for that one too, uh, where we shot groups, shot groups, shot groups, shot groups. And it was just a long time where I felt it was too much time just, you know, zeroing. Now, is it important to get actual data at 100, 200, 300? Yep, absolutely. So, but there's a time to be more streamlined with that too, right? And I think sometimes using steel uh, with a, a legit spotter, you can get good data, but sometimes there is real data on the paper. Like I went to a LE sniper class and one of the things we did, even though it took a little bit of time is we got our hundred yard, we were doing all that. We shot a group on paper at 200. We shot a group on paper at 300. So you could actually have the real data. It took like an hour for the whole class because they were pretty streamlined, but I thought that was uh that, that was pretty good. All right, so Kevin, you are a supporter. I also appreciate that. Um, Kevin, some other questions that you had, in addition, let me just make sure we covered that slide. Yeah, we did. Uh, some other questions that you had, uh, multiple emails, I just wanna make sure I kinda get to a few of them, is, uh, you know, it's important for me to answer everybody's questions, right? But I always do like to take care of the Patreons as well, so I always appreciate those guys. Where is... Well, I can't find them all of a sudden, but I will find them here in just a second. Folders. 
Hmm. Well, the joys. So anything else, other comments, things like that, that you guys uh, can come up with for me? Let me know. All right. Don't have any names on that one. Yeah, right. You know exactly who I'm talking about. But uh, And yeah, I would love to do a marksman class. We talked about finding a range up in Minnesota to potentially do that. Um, it's just a matter of you know what we can get done and and uh, what I can try to figure out, right? And that's that's the hard part is always finding a range because some of these places, um, you know, it's it's tough to it's tough to to have that basically. So, all right, I did find um, I did find the other questions. So we're gonna get to those here in just a second, and I'm gonna try to make this a favorite. There we go. All right. Uh, are there any red dot instructor programs or red dot classes that give the student, give the instructors or students the technical background on how a reflector site works at the high school physics level or better? Well, I don't know if I covered at the high school physics level or better, but maybe I covered at the junior high level. Uh, I don't know if anybody's watching who's been to one of my red dot classes, but um, I, I like to get into some of the nerd stuff of how it works. Now, I talk about the emitter and how it hits the glass, reflects back, how we have a notch filter, or that's why we have a different color lens, uh, is that it contrasts the color. So for example, on a red dot, we have a blue tint. On a green dot, we have a purple tint. So I, I don't know what level you would consider that, Kevin, uh, if that was like junior high. Um, it's probably not high school physics level, but I like to get into it a little bit because we talk about blockages, we talk about parallax, we talk about distortion and why some of those things are in there. And then we also get into some of the weeds on technical mounting. So I would throw my class in there, but I, and again, I'm not trying to brag, uh, but when I wrote my classes or developed my classes, I try to figure out where the voids are, even though that's kind of a cliche term to it that I don't like. But I like to get into that. And I will say that I'm not aware of any other Red Dot class that gets into as much nerdy detail as I do as far as installation and armor and shear strength versus tensile strength of screws and wet torque value versus dry torque value and tools and all that stuff. So, um, or bedding screws with, you know, so I, I get into a lot of that stuff because I nerd out about it because those are the issues that I see fail. So that's where, that's where I'm at. So, um, yeah, I, I think that's that's a good one. Excuse me. Is there a workaround or fix for Smith & Wesson M&P pistols with red dots where the loaded chamber indicator holes at the breech and it always sprays up? No, but I am aware of some companies actually welding that and then milling or machining it to basically fill the loaded uh, chamber indicator. And that's the same thing on... Um, I want to say it was the Prodigy as well had a loaded chamber indicator like that. And uh, there was a couple of companies that would basically do a little bit of a TIG weld and then they would fill that in and then clean it up. Uh, so, I mean, the question is, do you really need a loaded chamber indicator? I, I personally don't feel that you do because a professional should always know the status of their gun. So I took this from my uh, instructor mentor of mine who I admire, Tony Caspers, um, super knowledgeable, great shooter, great instructor, good person. He calls it a status check, okay? A lot of people refer to it as a press check, but he calls it a status check because what is the whole point of it? It's to check the status of the gun. So let's call it a status check. Let's call it what it is. And I was like, oh man, that makes so much sense. So I stole that from him and I like to give him credit. But the reality is I don't need a loaded chamber indicator because when I want to know if the gun is loaded or not, I'm going to do a status check or I'm just going to administrative task. I'm not going to rely on a little chamber indicator because those little chamber indicators, they don't always work in low light. They don't always work in limited light. There's a lot of, you know, factors that go into it. So that's a great question. And then, uh, Kevin, I think I'm wrapping up on yours here, uh, is what are some ways that an instructor can be a better teacher by putting themselves in the student's shoes, even though the instructor may not have the same concern? Well, number one is every instructor should still be a student. I'm, I cannot stress that enough. And when I teach instructor level classes, one of the things that I go through is that you must always be a student. You go to other classes, even if you feel they're below you or beneath your level, you might be surprised at how well somebody can translate information or how well somebody can transfer information in a way that you've never thought about. So what are the best way for you to put yourself in a student's shoes is to be a student. You should always be a student. Now, the busier you are as an instructor, the harder it is for to do that. I totally get that, but that is something that should be done. I still take classes every year, I try to take as many as I can, but I will admit, 
the busier I became as an instructor, as a traveling trainer, it's tougher for me to carve out four days, airfare, travel, hotel, whatever, to attend a class. But I try to do that as much as I can. And I also try to network with other people. And I have a mentor. Uh, I really like having mentors. I look, look to people who are more experienced than me, smarter than me, all that stuff. So um, you, then you list some examples, like not knowing what it's like to have the wrong dominant eye, how to ad- adapt crippling astigmatism issue, not knowing how to help someone with monovision, uh, color blindness. Yeah, exactly. All those things are, are interesting. And I've had to tell dudes, uh, like when they come through a class and they're like, this is what I see. I'm seeing this and this and this. And it's like, hey, man, it is time to go to the eye doctor. Like you legitimately need to have the eye doctor check out your eyes and figure out what's going on. And it might be time for a corrective lens or it might be time for, you know, LASIK or, or whatever it might be. So um, yeah, that's that. So let me uh, take a sip of coffee from my cool neon green limited edition Yeti cup. There will be a link in the description below. Please use my Yeti link. Hmm. I'm not going to lie. If Yeti sent out more green stuff, I would not complain. If any of you guys have a Yeti marketing connection, let me know. All right. A couple comments quick, then we'll get back to emails. Congrats on 100K. Living the dream. Good for you. Thanks, Leroy. I really appreciate that. Sometimes, I'm not going to lie, it's a scary nightmare, uh, but it is pretty awesome. And this is what I love doing. Like, I love I love making videos and interacting, and I still have to upload some older stuff that we had to take down with the whole suppressor deal, but I, I do love making videos. Like, at the core of it, I really enjoy that because it's a way for me to feel like I'm contributing to the community by sharing knowledge or sharing my perspective. And, you know, obviously, it, it appears that people are receiving it because we hit the 100 now. Am I ever going to be a grand thumb? Uh, man, I sure would love to have his numbers, right? He has like almost 3 million subs and every video he puts out, it seems like it's a million views because resource wise, that would open up so many doors for me. I could hire staff because I have extra income and have access to stuff sooner, all that good stuff. But the reality is, um, I would say grand thumb is probably the, the best firearms content creator out there as far as a hybrid, because some of his videos are just entertaining and they're really good, right? But they are a little informative, but they're entertaining. They're well-produced. He does a really good job. And then you have his other ones where they are just knowledge bombs and he's incredibly uh, informative and educating. Like those are the longer format ones where he maybe talks about some of his military experience or something like that. So yeah, I would love to get to that point, but I don't know if I'll ever get to the point where I'm just an entertainer. Like, uh, and I, I don't get me wrong. I'm not saying anything bad about Demolition Ranch, but... When I watch a Demolition Ranch video, I don't necessarily like learn a lot, but I'm entertained, right? And I learn like maybe how many phone books a 50 cal would go through or whatever it might be. But he's an incredible presenter and video creator. But the big thing is, is he's entertaining. He's engaging. So there's different styles out there, right? I'm going to do my style and hopefully it keeps growing. And if it keeps growing, awesome. If it doesn't, then I'll figure out something else to do. I'll probably start a cooking channel not going to lie. I like to eat. I like to cook. I like to make videos. I figure I can make that. That's my backup plan. And in reality, I could probably be a, you know, a millionaire by now if I would have put the resources in because of how like non-restricted food content in versus gun content, but I'm ranting. And, but this is what we do. This is what I like to do with the QAs is just kind of interact. So, uh, this is from Nick Nicholas. I apologize. How many classes per year do you try to get to as a student? Great question. So what I do, and this is just me kind of nerding out, is I will do a self-inventory and figure out what my personal goals are or what my personal voids are. So if I know that uh, right now I feel pretty strong in this category, but not so much in this, I'm going to try to find classes in this category. Or if I'm trying to refine things in my strength category and I want to continue to like improve a little bit, I will look you know, for other areas in that. Likewise... There are just trainers that I want to train with regardless of the topic because they are a respected member of the profession where I feel like I could learn from them how they teach, how they run a class, how they build rapport, all that stuff. So one of the things, um, let me answer your question first before I get distracted because sometimes I do get distracted, right? But how many classes per year do I try to get to as a student? I try to get to three or four. Um, And you know that's about one a quarter, but sometimes in the busier months, Now, there are some years where I'm only able to get to like, you know, two classes, but I try to get to three or four in a variety of topics. Like this year, I have a precision rifle class scheduled. Uh, I'm hopefully going to go to a a pistol carbine class. 
And then my third one is hopefully going to be some sort of a pistol class in the fall with uh, probably a high level competition shooter, just because I can work on some performance type stuff because I, I, I like to learn from everybody. Right. So I might work on, um, you know, the variety of things. The precision rifle class is going to be taught by some friends of mine. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm super excited about that. All right. So somebody might be in my driveway here. Give me one sec. But this is the joys of when I do this live is because I just want to make sure I don't have to sign for something. Looks good. So moving on. But yeah, um, other things that I look for in a class, uh, logistics, obviously. But then I try to figure out like what I'm hoping to gain from that class, how I'm looking to improve. Uh, and then value, because there's been classes, and Dustin can um, can confirm this, because uh, him and I will travel to classes sometimes together, which, by the way, Dustin, it's my turn to drive, so and I got my new rig, so we can, we can roll. But there have been times when we've looked at classes afterwards, and we're both serious students as well. Like, we, we, we have a very critical way of thinking, and it's not a bad way. Like, sometimes it's just good to be critical. But we'll look at a class, and we'll be like, man, that wasn't worth the time. Uh, because I felt like I could be more valuably spending that time on my own. Because if I get a whole day alone at the range with ammo, could I practice these skills alone? Because some classes, it's literally just organized practice. That's cool. I get all that. I'm at a level where I can go and I can be very productive with, I can organize my own practice time. But when I go to a class, I also want to learn. I want to learn new things. I want to learn different things. I want someone to point out where I can improve or what I'm doing wrong. So some of that stuff uh, is just kind of the things I keep in mind. So great, great question, man. Really good question. Kind of got me into some other topics. All right. So Kevin, uh, let me go back just to some of your emails here quick. Um, and I think maybe just one more on a problem, mistake, failure, miscommunication, an injury, or an ND happens. As an instructor to take care of that. Uh, got it. What are some productive ways for an instructor or group of instructors and AIs, which is assistant instructor, to learn from those? That's a really good question in general. And I would say this, it really comes down to uh, after action reviews is what the military term or AAR. And there was even critical incidents that I've been involved with where we've kind of called our own little mini AAR after to discuss like, you know, obviously we're okay, bad guys in jail or whatever it might be. What went right? Okay, I think this went good. I think this went good or whatever. What could we have done better or what went wrong, right? So it's important to look at that to figure out what the factors were, and then also, you know, what the contributing factors were. Because if we can prevent some of the contributing factors, some of the factors are just going to happen, right? But if it was a contributing factor, it wasn't the sole cause, but every little thing has consequence, right? Both good and bad. Like if I train really well, I have lockdown gear, i.e. what we saw in Nashville. I can tell those guys trained well and they had their gear squared away, okay? Especially the two shooters, uh, one was a red dot handgun. One was a rifle with a LPVO and an offset red dot. Guy has his stuff squared away. Looking at that, those gear, you can tell that they've got their gear squared away, and it appeared that they got their training squared away. Legit good work by good dudes. The consequence of that is they're able to do good work. And sadly, on the other side of that, we've seen officers with crappy gear. We've seen officers with crappy training, and they do crappy work. Garbage in, garbage out, right? Uh, hang on one sec here. I might have to sign for some. Give me one sec, guys. Can you guys give me a sec? This is the joys of live. I got to sign for a package. All right, dudes, we're back. UPS, brown Santa Claus. All right. All right, this is not OnlyFans. I swear, it looks like it. 
and I'm going to get crap, but it says only boats. It's a Honda side-by-side -side parts. So I swear I can open these because I know somebody's going to be like, oh my gosh, Dave's ordering stuff from, from OnlyFans, and that's not the case. So anyways, um, yeah, that's what I look for in classes. Yeah, so I got a hat, and this is what I was after is these little plugs right here. I had to wire some stuff in. So, But he sent some hats and stickers, so that's pretty cool. All right, and then I got, uh, I believe these are carbon fiber barrels from a company that I'll be checking out. And then this, this is a firearm, but I believe this is a Crusader Templar rifle. So yeah, looking forward to checking that out. I wish you could, sh I could show you that on live, but they, they don't let me show firearms. All right, so this is, uh, I think we're all caught up. All right, Dustin, some classes are just opportunities for the instructor to post on social media. True story. Dustin, did you ever, were you there? I don't think you were. This was before you started coming around. Uh, true story. I had one instructor. We brought in a national level instructor and he was running these drills and he would, you know, you'd basically do these reps where you would draw and you'd fire like three rounds 10 times slow, and he would just be calling up. Well, I looked back, and Mike, if you ever watch this, Mike can attest, the instructor is literally back there on his phone. Up! Up! Wasn't paying attention to students at all. So I started shooting, and he didn't, uh, all we did for that was uh, what's called negative targets. And it uh, basically, it's like you only uh, tape your misses. So you'd shoot the target, and then if you had it outside, you would tape those. So I saw that he wasn't paying attention. I just started shooting at clumps of mud on the berm. And then when he came and looked at your target, he'd be like, oh, nice job, man. Good shooting, good shooting. And it's like, you weren't even watching what I was doing. And that was so frustrating to me. And it was so disheartening that he was so disconnected. And, you know, I Somebody then asked him, like, well, how come you don't watch or whatever? Oh, everything I need to know is on the target. I can tell everything I need to know of, of how, where your holes are. Well, obviously he couldn't because I was shooting clumps of mud. And then he told me I was doing so great because my hole in the target was the same hole as it was before. And uh, it, it was just really, really frustrating for me. And I get it. We're all addicted to our devices and all that other stuff. But, um, man, I... Uh, it's just, it, it's disheartening, right? It's just disheartening to, to see that. So, but anyways, that's just, that's, that's how it goes sometimes uh, with certain people. So uh, yeah. So those are a good excuse uh, for instructors to post on social media or check their social media. Uh, what do I think of the new 4473? How bad do you think? I literally just got mine in today and I have not read it all. So I don't have a comment other than like literally the box showed up probably an hour before uh, my live stream. So uh, we'll see. Every time I, I get a new 4473, which is the background check form, I usually have to like make sure I go through everything and make sure boxes are checked and, and all that stuff. So uh, yeah, the, the joys, <sighs> the joys, right? All right. Uh, so maybe we'll talk about that in another one. All right. This one is from Scott. I have an ACOG on my go-to. I have shot with it for a year. I don't have any real complaints. However, I can't help but think that I may have preferred a battery-powered ACOG. I don't know, man. I do like the battery-powered ACOGs. Now, here's my thing. I'm generally an LPVO guy versus ACOG just because I like the versatility of an LPVO. But if I was buying an ACOG today, I I don't know. I'm leaning, I would lean towards a battery-powered one just because uh, sometimes the other ones can get washed out a little bit, especially like low light situations where you're in low light, uh, like in a dark warehouse or a garage, and then your target might be out in a bright area, that kind of thing. But the other cool thing with an ACOG, the, the non-battery ones, and one of my favorite LPVOs, which is the Trigicon 1-4 to AccuPoint, which has a little fiber optic and tritium deal, is I just grab them and they just work all the time. I never have to worry about changing a battery. I never have to turn it on. I never have to worry about turning it off. They just work. And generally speaking, they work pretty well. So something to be said about that, because still, out of all the LPVOs that I have, and I have a lot, I'm very blessed to have a nice wide library of LPVOs. One of my favorites still to this day is the Trigicon TR24, the 1-24, to the green triangle. 
It's just a sweetheart of an optic. Does it have holds? Nope, but I can hit solid out to 300 yards with it. Uh, is it bright? Yeah. Does it work well in low light? Overall, can it wash out? Yep, sometimes it can, right? There's no free lunch, but I never have to worry about a battery. It has great eye relief. The glass is really good. The tip of the triangle is what I zero. I cover at 200, the base is 300, and that generally works really awesome for me, and it's a one to four, which offers me a good amount of magnification. I actually have it on an SBR right now. Love that optic. Absolutely love that optic. One of my one of my absolute favorites. So yeah, that kind of kind of matters. Uh, all right, uh, yeah. So it would have been before your time when Mike and I were hosting some classes at the pit, and uh, I'll tell you about it offline. I don't want to trash other instructors or whatever. But Phil, good to have you in. Uh, I probably should have told you I was doing a live. We had kind of an impromptu live here, but all good in the hood. So hopefully it wasn't too important that you needed to call. I can give you a call when we're done here. Uh, yeah, let me check back in with some emails here quick, and then I think we'll probably wrap up. We're coming up on an hour, and uh, we'll we'll figure out, we'll give away a prize, and, and we'll go from there. So it looks like comments are still looking pretty good, and uh, we still got our viewers going. All right, let me check in. This one's from Art. Loving the live QA each month, and again, great job having a guest attendee. He was referring to uh, Josh from Holosun, and I'm, I'm looking forward to doing... Uh, I really want to do more guests. So I've been reaching out to a few of my industry colleagues to figure out how we can do that logistically, all that kind of stuff. But I love having the live guests. Like, I think that is really cool too. So you will see, you, you guys will see more of that. Uh, in regards, my question is for you in regards to your daily EDC loadout. At the moment, I currently carry my CCW, a handheld light, a folding knife, thoughts on pepper spray, tourniquet. I like the EDC of a balancing act of what's actually comfortable to carry and what's excessive. If it's too cumbersome, the more likely I'm going to leave it behind, which does me no good. I'd love to hear your thoughts. For sure, man. Uh, so for me, oops, geez, hopefully I still, yeah, didn't bump it. Uh, firearm, spare magazine. I have a weapon mounted light on most of my carries now, and sometimes it is going to be a slimmer light. Uh, like, for example, on my 43X, I have the TLR7 sub on my Staccato CS. That'll have a TLR7. Uh, on my, one of my staccatos, it's a full size light, whatever, but I like having a light. I go back and forth. I, I don't think you need a light for an EDC on the a weapon mounted light, I should say, uh, because obviously most people are going to have to identify your threat first. Whereas a law enforcement officer might be using the light to search things like that, or at home defense. But that's a whole nother topic. Spare magazine. I like carrying a spare mag when I can stoppages, capacity, whatever, but do I always not always, you know, but I like to when I can, especially with my new appendix rig, which I know I got to do the dad bot appendix carry video. Um, I like having a spare mag. Uh, otherwise, I carry a phone. Obviously, a communication device is uh, super important. I carry a flashlight. Right now, I've been carrying the Streamlight Wedge. And I know this is not a great tactical flashlight. It's more of a flood beam at 500 lumens and then 1,000 lumens. And I wish you could lock it on at 1,000. But for a slim, compact light that's not super expensive, that's rechargeable, the majority of the time that I'm using a flashlight is as a dad. Like my kid dropped something or we need to open this up or whatever it might be. I'm not doing tactical ninja stuff with it. So is it the best tactical ninja light? Nope, it's not. But is it a phenomenal EDC light that has a flood pattern so it's easy to find a lost something on the floor of the car or whatever? Yeah, so I'll probably do a separate video on this comparing it to like my cloud um, MCH or something like that, which is more of a tactical light. So there's pros and cons, but I am carrying this and I, I really do like it. Obviously I have wallets, I have cash, I have a pocket knife. Now, first aid kit, I will admit, I don't always carry a tourniquet. Sometimes if I'm wearing cargo pants and stuff like that, I'll throw a tourniquet in. However, I do have a little grab and go kit in every one of my vehicles. However, is that gonna do me any good in a mall? Nope, it's not. Now, some people do the ankle medical kit, but what if I'm wearing shorts in the summer, right? So I would love to find some sort of a small micro kit that I could potentially throw in a cargo pocket really flat or maybe in a back pocket and something I can look at like wallet sized, but I haven't found quite the combination yet. And then as far as pepper spray, yeah, having an alternate uh, force option might not be a bad option, and especially if you can carry something small and compact with a pocket clip that you could throw in an off pocket or maybe a back pocket or something like that. Might not be a bad idea to have that. Uh, I carry pepper spray in my truck. Again, I don't always carry it on my person, but I definitely think for a variety of reasons that having an alternate force option is not a bad idea. You can use pepper spray in non-lethal situations, which is 
really, really important sometimes. You can use it on multiple people. You can use it as a deterrent. I mean, there's a lot of other tactical uses that we would use it for in law enforcement, like extraction and stuff like that, but that's not here nor there. So that definitely not something bad to consider. Not something bad at all. All right, let me just check in with comments here quick. Uh, I think we are doing good. Uh, DeGraw, what would a good entry-level LPVO be? Currently have a Holosun 510, and I'd like to take an LPVO class. Um, can you post a comment with your rough budget, and then I can maybe, like when you say entry-level, I don't know if we're talking 300 bucks or 600 bucks, and assume that you're going to have to spend uh, 100, 150 on a mount. Okay, so just assume that you're going to need 100, 150 on a mount. But throw me a dollar, and then we'll talk. And then um, let me answer an email question here quick. This one, uh, yeah, we wrapped up art. This one's from Quentin. Do I like backup irons? Uh, and now he did send a picture of like a rifle with like multiple backup iron sights. So like backups to the backup. Now I will say this. Uh, I like the idea of a backup sight, especially if I had a red dot having a set of like MBUS or MBUS pros or whatever. Yes, it does make sense. But red dots are so good nowadays that failure is, is pretty minimal that I, I'm not saying they're not important, but it's not a bad idea, right? For LPVOs, my backup site is an offset red dot. The chances of those two things breaking are pretty slim, and the amount of time that it takes me to take off the LPVO to access the backup sites is significant. Well, no, you're going to be saying, but Dave, there's offset iron sights. Yes, there is. But if I'm going to have offset iron sights, I'd rather just have an off to, uh, offset little red dot, like the Arasaka mount that I've done a video on in the past. That's one of my favorites. So that's uh, that's what I like a lot. Uh, those those are those are my options. Uh, this last one is from Sean. How's it going? Just came across you on YouTube and watched a very detailed video on co-witnessing iron sights. Yep, that's a good one. We've gotten a lot of views, so that's good. I have one question. I'm looking for some insight. I just got my hands on a Shield Plus. Uh, currently the stock Knights blacked out green tritium with a red or orange front. Very nice. Happy. My question is with the front being red or orange, doesn't matter what color red dot I get. I'm planning on a 507 K in red or green leaning towards green. Uh, doesn't, don't know if it matters or not. So what he's referring to is with the backup sites and then what color either red or green. The reality is it doesn't matter because when you're practicing with red dot, you should be target focused. So you're ignoring those iron sights. They're all going to be fuzzy, blurry, whatever, because I'm focused on my target and the dot, I'm just looking through the window and the dot is on my target. I personally, for that reason though, I prefer just plain black. I don't want tritium backup sights because it is potentially one thing to distract me. The other reason is uh, on my guns that are set up for night vision, having a tritium front sight and a dim red dot that's down in night vision mode, the two look about the same. Like, and that tritium can, can be a distraction through your night vision device. So just plain black, the backup sights are just there as just that backup in case the dot goes down, which again, most of these dots nowadays are pretty solid. We're not seeing that so long as you're keeping up on regular maintenance, checking screws, checking batteries, you're probably not gonna have a dot failure. And if you do, then you have your plain black sights as a backup, that's just my preference. Now, as far as red or green, uh, that's going to depend on your eyes. If you can look through them, great. For me, where I'm at right now, uncorrected, even though I did have my eye doctor give me a prescription, um, I personally think green Holosun 508 is a little crisper than the red, but the red is a little brighter, but it does have a little bit more of that bloom. So that's just you know something to consider. Um, so yeah, great question there. All right, uh, under $600 for LPVO. If you can find a used or a Steiner, I think it's the PX4i or P4xi, it's one of the two, but the Steiner 1 to 4 around that price point, and I think new, they're a little bit more now. Back in the day, you could find those on sale for like 500 bucks, and that was a smoking deal because it does have a daylight visible, red dot, glass is good. It's a simple 1 to 4, good reticle, they're durable. I would look at one of those. Uh, some of the primary arms that are that price point that are in that kind of higher ish price point that $500 range are pretty solid as well. Those would probably be my go to's or maybe like a used uh, Trigicon one to four occasionally you can find for on that five to 600 bucks. Um, I feel like there is one more that I'm, I'm not thinking of. Um, the Vortex PST, honestly, I have mixed feelings on. I know they're around that 600 bucks, but I've had to send a lot of the one to six PSTs back for electronics issues. So is what it is. Reticle's pretty good, not the best. Electronics are kind of meh, in my opinion. Uh, glass is pretty good. So 
that's that's one of the things there. Um, you know, it it's tough, right? It's it's a little tough to say uh, what where we're at with that. But I would say that look at the Steiner, the primary arms. Um, man, Dustin, I feel like we've talked about another one that is is just I'm having a brain delay right now. If it's some of the mid grade, it's not the mid grade vortex, but I. Having a brain delay. Steiner, Trigicon, maybe a Vortex, maybe a uh, Primary Arms. Yeah, hopefully that helps. All right, uh, live shows are a real highlight. I would love to ask Federal Ammo real-time questions, but I won't hold back. Ooh, there are some hard questions that need answers. That could be the tagline right there, Scott. You're watching the Q&A live with industry panel. The hard time, wait, no. The hard questions that need answers. What do you think of that? We could try that, right? Uh, but yeah, yeah. Um, I would, I would love to have Johan. He's their LE tech lead from the ammo. I'm going to reach out to him, and hopefully he's going to be one of my guests where we can talk real ammo stuff. I personally carry Federal ammo for Spear. Uh, Hornaday is really good too, but Fe Johan is a phenomenal source of information. A been there, done that dude, walking encyclopedia. We actually did a couple of other videos with him in the past interviews, but it would be really cool to have him on live. I'm going to reach out. I'm going to follow up with him to see if we can do that. So, all right. This one is from the imp first time here. Well, Hey, welcome, man. Thanks for, thanks for stopping by, uh, X LEO and range master. So yeah, that's you. Is there a mailing list so I can get here again? Just got the canic dark side, uh, go to guns and You can sign up for our email list. Uh, you can also like share, subscribe to all of us on social media. And, uh, that way we, when we do events and stuff like that, but yes, we do have a weekly newsletter that comes out in email, but real reality is it's just a summary of what posts and stuff that we've made on the website, videos, that kind of thing. I'd like to do more newsletter type stuff, but, uh, like share, subscribe and stay tuned. Make sure you hit the bell, all that stuff. That's the best way. But yeah, thanks for stopping by, man. I appreciate it. Appreciate it. Hopefully in uh, retirement, treating you well, guys. That's going to do it. We're a little over an hour. It looks like we're all caught up on comments. I'm going to have a sip of coffee, even though it's uh, 1.30 in the afternoon. Man, that's good. And no, Dustin, it does not have a kick. I'm not going to lie, guys. Sometimes when I work from home, my coffee may or may not have a kick. And if you know what I mean, you know, anybody ever watch Justified? Your coffee with a kick? Remember her? Uh, I think, uh, what was his name? Quinn? I think he killed her in one of the episodes or whatever. But yeah, Coffee with a Kick, something. That was one of my favorite shows. A really good show. I owe Lance uh, Lance to that. Hey, you are subscribed. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. All right. Um, okay, guys. I admit, I don't know. I don't know what the prize is. I don't know what I got. And I don't even. I, I Yeah, I don't know. So we'll see what we can come up with here uh, from... Rainier Arms is sponsoring this episode. So thanks to Rainier Arms, and I screwed up because I realized I forgot to load their graphic. Uh, Rainier Arms is out of Washington. However, they ship most of their stuff out of their Midwest distribution facility. So that means it gets to coast to coast super fast. They have great customer service. They have a wide variety of products. They're adding new stuff all the time. They also have the Apex Club, which for a low annual fee of just under 100 bucks, it's kind of like their prime membership. You get free ground shipping, you get early access, and you get a discount on everything site-wide. And I know recently that when they got their batch of uh, Staccato CSs in, Apex members were the first to get them. Ask me how I know, because that's a hot item. So hot items, they're going to give access to Apex first. Love them. Good people. Rainier Arms sponsors this episode. And uh, again, I don't know what the prize is, but we are going to make sure that we give away a cool prize. Um, yes. And yeah, Johan has uh, forgotten more about, yeah, and he's just a super cool dude. He for sure is. And I've gotten to talk to him, you know, at, offline and he's got some cool stories. So yeah. And thank you very much. Uh, glad you're still working in the industry and uh, hopefully uh, enjoying retirement and stuff. So Let's give away our prize. We are going to shuffle the emails and the comments. And again, if uh, you know you are not familiar with the rules, please check out the rules, which are posted on the screen as we shuffle our comments. All right, we are back. Our random number comment is... Dustin, Johan has forgotten more... <laughs> All right, Dustin, next time I see you, I will uh, I will get you your prize from Rainier Arms. Dustin is our winner. Thank you very much for tuning in, everybody. As always, 
If you want to see your question on the show and you can't catch the live, make sure you send it to the email address shown on the screen, the QA at gunsandtactics.com. We put them on the show. If you want to support the show, the channel, anything that you can, we greatly appreciate all of our Patreon supporters. We do have different levels. If you want to support the channel, anything from just a dollar or two all the way on up, every little bit does help. If you are in the 10 spot or above club, your name could appear in our videos thanking you. And we will have exclusive QA for our patrons. We'll have some exclusive giveaways. And we also do have a patron only Facebook group where we can kind of interact and talk a little bit more. So if you want to support the channel, the best way is through our Patreon page. Thank you guys very much for watching and have a great day. All right, now I got to finish it, right? I had to do my thumbnail, had to smile for the thumbnail. I think we got everything covered. So thanks guys. I appreciate it. Have a great rest of your month. Tomorrow's April Fool's Day, so have a little bit of fun out there. Take care. Be safe. Thanks for watching. Have a great day.